Ladies and gentlemen, now it is time to start our first keynote speech of the day by Ms. Kayani D. Alves under the topic of global supply chain and trade shift in the new normal. To give an introduction to Ms. Kayani D. Alves, let me now invite Dr. Achala Pallegadra, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Manufacturing and Industrial Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Smitya, for introducing me. And uh, I'm going to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, Ms. Gayanidi Alvis. Gayani is a leading supply chain professional. She was a former director, customer service and management committee member of Unilever Sri Lanka. She was responsible for supply chain activities. She has well over two decades of experience with uh, Unilever locally and overseas. Gaini holds an MBA from Postgraduate Institute of Management, University of Sri Jayavarmanapura. And she also holds MSc in Food Process Engineering from University of Reading, United Kingdom. Gaini is the global chairperson of Women in Logistics and Transport, WILAT. She is the immediate past president of Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT and also founding chairperson and advisor of Pilat Sri Lanka. She is the only fellow of both CILT and Institute of Supply and Materials Management in the country. She is a council member of Open Institute of Sri Lanka. She has been strong advocate of women empowerment and has received many awards and accolades for her career developments or and achievements. She is a non-executive independent director of Sri Lanka, director of Singha Sri Lanka, and director of Logicare Private Limited, and a board member of CSR Sri Lanka. She has been a consultant to the World Bank, ADB, and many leading blue chip companies, and a visiting faculty member of postgraduate programs in many local and foreign universities. With that note, we are warmly welcome Ms. Gayanidi Alvis to do keynote speak. Thank you very much. <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for the warm introduction, uh, generous in warm introduction. And uh, yesterday, actually, I took part in the uh, inauguration ceremony. I must tell you, it was very well organized and I attended some of the programs. So I'd like to congratulate Dr. Asela Kulatunga, uh, Dr. Namal, and the entire organizing committee for organizing such an important topical uh, conference, research conference, especially during the pandemic period. And that didn't deter them they organized uh, in a virtual manner. So thank you very much for inviting me. So let me first uh, share my presentation. I hope the slides are vis visible to you, right. Okay, so as uh, the topic that was mentioned, my uh, topic in the next 45 minutes that I'll be talking about is the global supply chains and the trade shifts uh, in the new normal. I will also be talking about uh, pre-pandemic, some of the trade shifts that happened and then how that got accelerated during the COVID period and, and now how those are getting emerged as a new normal and how we as supply chain uh, professionals should really be mindful of these new shifts that are happening for us to really restructure, repurpose our supply chains. So as we all know, I mean, COVID pandemic really impacted our lives and livelihoods from the toilet paper to the uh, computer chips, you know, items that we really require on a day-to-day -day basis got disrupted. Supply chains were really taken for granted by everybody, right? And supply chain was mostly at the backstage. 
and it was expected to operate in a kind of autopilot way. But COVID pandemic really, uh, with the disruption that happened in the global supply chains, it was not only a, a industry or a co company problem, it became a social problem because whatever that day to day that we require was not available because of the pandemic. And now with that awareness and you know the everybody like starting from the from the prime minister to a president of a country to media personnel, like supply chain has become a household name now. And everyone is talking about supply chain and how things are not available. So now it has become an uh, you know, important area that everybody is talking about. So for us as supply chain professionals, it is good news. It has come to the front stage now, right? So as, as uh, Thomas Friedman said, supply chain cannot tolerate even a 24 hour disruption. So if you don't take any notice of this disruption that is going to happen, you will lose a lot. I mean, we all saw the impact that supply chain disruption happened to our companies. The companies who didn't really take supply chain seriously, didn't have visibility and understanding of the supply chain. They really were impacted seriously. I mean, it would be like, you're pouring cement to a bottomless pit in an oil well. So that is how it would be. So it is important now, almost we are completing two years with the pandemic. Those who didn't really understand their supply chain and the network really got impacted. Why? Because in the past, how we manage the supply chain was purely traditionally on the efficiency aspect. Our main priority was the cost efficiencies. We really was fanatic about us. Yes, that is important. And therefore, we really wanted to source uh, products from the cheapest sourcing location. That was China, right? For most uh, around the world, it was China. China became the factory of the world. And we were trying to minimize inventory in our supply chain network. And therefore, most of us tried to run very lean inventories. We didn't have much buffers in our system because our focus was efficiency and optimization of supply chain truth at that time. But all these was really tested because we were moving to single sourcing, optimizing of supply chain, minimizing our inventory buffers. All this really was put to the test when the pandemic really hits us. So China, which became the, you know, the factory of the world, was at the epicenter of this uh, you know, whole disruption. So we had to do something about it. And I mean, if you really look at now, even you see the global supply chain crisis every day in the media that you see all these issues. And it came to a point where in the G20 summit, the world leaders were talking about how to de-bottleneck the supply chain disruptions. And in the US, the infrastructure bill and the lot of, uh, you know, uh, improvements to the supply chain to minimize the supply chain disruption in the countries are being looked at. And shipping companies, you know, shipping rates are skyrocketing now because of the whole disruption that happened because we talk about VUCA world that we live in. And I mean, this is a situation where the whole world, both demand and supply both got impacted. When both gets impacted, it's really impactful to the supply chain and very difficult. In fact, it was mentioned recently that the entire shipping industry in the third quarter this year will make a operating profit of 37.24 billion, which is what they achieved in the past 10 years. You could imagine how the impact that is happening to the companies and the prices, consumer prices in the whole world. And we are experiencing that in Sri Lanka as well. So this was the, the impact that happened to the global supply chain because we are in a hugely globalized environment now. And if you look at the, the supply chain, China, as I mentioned to you, is being the, uh, the factory of the world, right? And Chinese share of the world trade, if you look at, because all this happened in the Hubei province when this uh, pandemic started, Right, and Hubei accounted 1% of the Chinese exports in 2019. And most of the key industries, such as the 
automotive, the electronics, the biopharmaceuticals, all that were there got impacted. And also, as we all know, China is the biggest, world's biggest active pharma ingredient manufacturer in the world. Now we get pharmaceuticals from mainly from India and Pakistan, but they do some API manufacturing locally, but they also are dependent on Chinese API uh, sources. So when all these things happen, you know, the whole world impact was really felt. And uh, uh, as per Dunn and Bradstreet study, they were saying 938 out of 1,000 Fortune companies, they are tier one and both tier one and tier two suppliers got impacted. Now, some of us in our countries, we didn't really know beyond our immediate suppliers. So that was a huge shock to most of us. So it is important for us to understand how this all supply chain crisis unfolded, although we know, know because it had rippled effect, rippled effects of the entire chain reaction that happened in the entire supply chain, a global supply chain. So when, when the disruption happened, China started exporting the personal protective equipment to all corners of the world. And when the containers got stuck in certain parts of the world where you didn't have return cargo going in, out of that places, there was a huge shortage of shipping containers uh, uh, you know, uh, happen in some of the exporting countries, especially in the South Asian, the West African and all these countries where when the, the real demand happened, when countries came out of the lockdown uh, in the Europe and the Americas and all that, the huge uh, demand spike could not be catered to because there was an equipment shortage. There was a huge backlog that had to be uh, cleared because on and off different countries were going into lockdown from wave one to two to three. So this whole disruption, when one country is coming out of the lockdown, the other country is getting into the lockdown, which created a huge chock block in the entire global supply chains, right? On top of that, we all know that because of the economic slowdown, there were a lot of pandemic, uh, the, lot of layouts, layoffs happen in, in countries. Job losses were huge. And skilled labor, there was a shortage. And we saw what happened in the, in the US and they were, Joe, Joe, Joe Biden, president of US was, you know, mandating the ports to operate 24 seven. It's not easy to do that. There are union issues, all that had to be looked at and the standard times that you have to work. And on top of that, because of the huge backlog that you need to clear the component shortages. And that's the issue that we are experiencing now in the automobile industry and other industries where uh, chips are required. So these, all these, because the entire supply chain pipeline, we didn't have enough inventory in the first place because that was the way that we managed pre-pandemic. And with the huge spike in demand came in and the supply disruptions were there, you know, that really made a huge block in the entire chain. So with all these, whether COVID or not, we need to understand the supply chain risks that we have to face because most of us very often don't really understand what are the risks that we are faced with in, the, in our operations. So it is very important for companies to understand the ability to anticipate the risk and the impact that it can make, because when COVID happens, which we all call a black swan effect, you know, it came as a surprise to us because it didn't happen in, in you know, ability to anticipate was so difficult, but when it happened, the entire impact was so phenomenal and it was very difficult to respond to that uh, situation. So as organizations, it's important for us to understand a simple classification of supply chain risks based on the probability and the impact to the business to understand what are the manageable surprises, what are the common business challenges that we explain, uh, experience in the supply chains? You know, what are the things that are brewing, you know, like the things like Brexit and various uh, issues, the geopolitical issues and the US-China trade tension that we all saw. You know, these, when these things are brewing, we should understand and see proactively how do we really relocate our sourcing uh, 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 locations? How do we really manage it proactively? All that has to be looked at. 
because most organizations didn't really uh, were re not ready for that and and the huge i mean we never heard of a thing like that in in april last year we saw oil prices went below zero why because we didn't have storage capacity and if you had storage capacity in your countries you would have been able to make use of that opportunity to stock up and that would have really helped you and that's what china did at that time right and these were things that proactively some countries were making use of and the whole impact really impacted certain industries very differently certain industries were highly exposed you know and they were severely impacted but there are certain industries had a uh, impact which was really manageable and especially in the health sector and the telecommunication industry you know real estate and specific industries the impact was so uh, not so high like in the other area so what most companies did was they repurposed the supply chains moving and quickly pivoting to the areas where there was opportunity so it was important to understand these aspect now we saw even in sri lanka uh, you know some country companies in the apparel industry they moved into quickly put personal protective equipment manufacturing and companies were trying to look at uh, uh, especially in, in in overseas we saw general motors and ford autom automobile companies switching into uh, you know uh, breathing equipments you know the, they are converting their operations into uh, into health sector equipment manufacturing right uh, and we also saw in the airline industry the airline industry you know passenger movement was not happening so therefore we uh, the most com com countries were convert converting the passenger airline uh, you know uh, seats and spaces removed uh, spaces were used to transport cargo in fact uh, it it actually went to the extent in singapore airlines they converted the singapore airline into a restaurant and you know online pop up sale was sold in 30 minutes like 300 dollars so that is how a company pivoted and repurposed their supply chains to quickly uh, uh, you know grab the opportunities that came their way uh, in the in the during the crisis although we are still not out of it right so covid 19 therefore push companies to do things remotely you know and and also it actually accelerate digitalization because when you're working in remote location digitalization is a great equalizer and we need to really look at how do we manage digitalization automation and we saw a resurgence of the a resurgence of these initiatives the technology advancements and enhancements in the supply chain so i'll just take you back a little bit about pre covid how the global supply chains were uh, you know uh, operating and as i mentioned to you uh, pre covid the global supply chains as i mentioned like you know most companies were moving into china because most focus was the cost efficiencies because china was the factory of the world so most companies were moving into china and because chinese uh, had the infrastructure the supply chain maturity was there they had developed they had the well developed transport and logistics service infrastructure and they had the entire primary and intermediary supply network so they had companies could easily access to the growing chinese market and you know ensure uh, you know consolidation and get you can leverage on scale to manage your supply chains but then came the geopolitics the us china trade tension you know and with that also and the long transportation cost distances that you had to ship out the goods and especially because the market uh, sourcing ma sourcing country and the uh, the consumer markets were in in two different areas and therefore the transportation cost was very uh, uh, high so we need to understand sorry sorry about it so we needed to understand how uh, this consolidation is going to help us and then came in because they realized when you are putting all your eggs into one basket because that was emerging even pre covid because of the trade tension between us and china and all that 
So the companies were moving their sourcing location to close the geographies in Asia, like distributed offshoring, you call it. So they were looking at multiple sourcing locations, regionally integrated supply chains. You know, that actually because of the transportation cost and all that, you will, uh, the companies were getting lower labor and supply chain costs, but still keeping the market access intact, right? But this became actually added a lot of complexity because unlike China, which had a very good infrastructure, when you are moving from globalization to deglobalization to some extent moving uh, closer to your markets, it will add other complexities in life. Coordinating logistics become difficult, and you may have you may see infrastructure gaps. Then it evolved to another level where you had to bring it closer to home further. So you don't bring it on show, but then you bring in uh, close to your uh, uh, consumer markets. Like for instance, Americans, US market, they were actually moving, uh, relocating to Mexico in the, in the South America. In Europe, they were moving into East, uh, uh, Eastern European countries. So this relative cost of production between supply and consumer markets arbitrage was, you know, is going to be beneficial, was benefiting the companies. So you were closer to the consumer markets and also they actually, uh, CKD product strategy, completely knocked down product strategy was, they were able to implement that. And that actually led to, uh, uh, little, I mean, more than the previous situation that although it was, closer to the market and more consumer um, uh, able to quickly supply to the consumer, but there were other challenges because you didn't have the volume advantage like we used to have it like in China. So the higher labor costs uh, and risk of changing from one market to another rules of origin criteria and all that uh, were other challenges that we had. And with all this, the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, evolved. And with that, we see now Companies are now trying to onshore consolidation, de globalization. I mean, it's not easy. It took years for us to globalize. I don't think it will happen in the next decade or so, but it is emerging towards that uh, you know, trend now. Companies are now localizing, trying to see, de risk their supply chain uh, and understand to ensure the, the national security, especially because if you don't have chips, you cannot ensure uh, the production will stop in most countries. So then how do you manage your entire uh, supply chain and supply of goods in the, in, the, in the country? So we need to then develop the quality infrastructure. Uh, you know, we can make use of the industry 4.0 advantage with using technology and all that. You have access to the market, domestic market, unlike the previous situation, but of course, the flip side of it is the higher production cost because you don't have the scale advantage. So these were some of the emerging trends that were happening in the trade shift that were happening. And we saw how Brexit, the impact of Brexit that happened um, uh, in, in when UK moved out of the EU, right? And we now see lots of issues and they were anticipating border control issues. Now there are lead time uh, has got increased so many, uh, uh, you know, bureaucratic paperwork, border delays, you know, import tariffs, additional inventory you had to keep and all that. So these changes in the whole global supply chains actually prevents the seamless movement of, uh, uh, you know, goods. So what happened in the last, if you go back in, uh, in the last five years or so for the global supply chains, what are the the issues that we happened in the global supply chain in the last five years, what impacted the global supply chains, right? I mean, we see uh, in the past, we had supplier issues because when you manage with a single source, obviously when there is an issue, you will have an impact. You have natural disasters. Even now you see climate emergencies is real, real, is a real threat to the supply chains now. And of course, with increased digitalization, the cyber attacks, are very common now. And with political and, uh, you know, geopolitical issues and trade wars, you know, are going to be a common thing in global supply chains. 
So how do we face this new reality is what is important for us to understand. Because as the world economy uh, is contracting to some extent, uh, but, but they are saying IMF is predicting global economic <clears throat> to grow by 5.4% in 2021. And there is a slight dip in, in 2022. So although we see countries are coming out of the lockdown situation, countries are going into recession, cost of living is uh, going higher and higher. Shipping prices are going skyrocketing. So with all these, there will be a huge impact to the, uh, uh, the, the economies in the countries. So it is, imp and as supply chain professionals, we have to understand this. And these shifts have really made consumers also to behave differently. Because consumers are now looking at very mindfully about their shopping. They're cutting down on the discretionary uh, shopping. They are trying to grow things uh, uh, in their home gardens because they are worried about the pandemic impacts. And we see a huge rise in the digital space in the omnichannels. There is a growth in the online consumer base and contactless services. And we also see a resurgence in the uh, local networks. I mean, we saw that in Sri Lanka, how small players, SMEs and micro uh, SMEs have really emerged and uh, you know, got into this space uh, with the local network supplying goods to the uh, consumers. And uh, established companies, because of the non-availability, consumers have now moved away. There has been a huge impact to brand loyalty. Consumers are more concerned about availability of product, the value and quality, and uh, whether the product is organic or you know, uh, uh, safe to eat or healthy aspect of the food are the considerations consumers are looking at it. So the brand, the products are really having an impact uh, with the COVID emergence, right? And hygiene, health and well-being has become a very important aspect in the uh, whole uh, consumer shift in the way that the consumer behave uh, in their spending patterns and how they manage their supply chains, uh, have day-to-day -day operations. and uh, and. Uh, Mostly, I mean, all of us know, even in Sri Lanka, home gardening, uh, cooking things at home, uh, dining out is not happening now to a great, I mean, of course, uh, in Sri Lanka now people are going out, but globally, if you look at the whole um, uh, hospitality industry, there is a slowdown happening, but the emergence uh, of COVID, different variants are now stopping all these things. So we see a huge change in the consumer behavior. And as supply chain professionals, we need to understand one size will not fit for all. We need to understand these emerging consumer behaviors. Because consumers, if you don't understand and uh, you know, manage those requirements, supply chains will not perform in a way that we want to uh, you know, bring the organization to a different level. So a study that was done about the global supply chains of the future, uh, the respondents uh, responded by saying the companies now will focus more away from uh, efficiencies to more resilient supply chains. And that is the important part that we need to really look at. Because if you look at only the cost efficiencies, when something uh, really happened like a disruption like COVID pandemic, you really get impacted and you don't have any supply uh, you know, available uh, to cater to the market. So resilience is going to be a very important aspect that you need to look at. The risk has to be clearly understood. So you cannot only look at sing single sourcing. And you're also looking at different inventory models away from the just-in-time. You need to look at just-in-case inventory models where you need to look at buffering up inventories at different weak linkages in the, in the supply chains, right? And companies are moving away from China now and finding alternative locations. As I mentioned to you, it was happening before COVID. Now, slowly, it's also, that doesn't mean they will totally move away from China, but they are seeing some emergence of shifting happening as a China plus one strategy. And increasingly, supply chains will have to have strengthened relationships with our suppliers and partners. 
and the visibility and transparency of your supply chain. Do we have visibility beyond your tier one suppliers? Do we know our supply network? Have you mapped it? Are some of the things that we need to really look at. Because if you look at, as I mentioned earlier also, the risk is important for us to understand efficiency, yes. While looking at the efficiency, we need to understand the risk. So ability to the supply chains have to develop the ability to resistance, resist, and the recover, the capacity to resist and recover supply chains faster. How quickly we can come back to, uh, you know, uh, from the disruption, how quickly we can recover and clear our black clogs, how quickly come back to the normal situation where we were before the disruption. We need to understand that. You know, we know uh, in certain situations in some parts of the world when there is a disruption, that happens, the country in itself took, you know, uh, uh, climate uh, disasters that happened, it took many weeks for the whole country to come back on track in that particular geographies. So supply chains cannot withstand such a long periods of uh, disruption. So it is important for us to understand and develop the resilience. So do we really know the entire supply chain from where are we getting our supplies? Do we know our supplier? Do we know where your, our product is coming from? Are these products ethically sourced or ethically, uh, or what kind of pesticides that are being used? If it's, if it's agricultural produce, we need to understand that. How is it being processed? What kind of chemicals are being processed? What kind of alternative factories that are available for processing of the product, right? Packaging, distribution, consumption, disposal, the whole end-to-end -end circularity. You know, how do we really manage? Do we have the visibility of our supply chain from the point of origin to the point of consumption? Very important because supply chains are under close scrutiny now. There are various, uh, you know, laws and regulations when you're exporting, you know, uh, companies and consumers also becoming very conscious about whether your supply chains are ethical and sustainable. So do we have visibility about supply chains? Do we know our supply chains very well? Have we mapped our supply chain? Once you do that, only you will be able to, uh, you know, identify the uh, weak links in our supply chains. Then only we can, put mitigation, mitigatory measures in place to manage our supply chains. So it's important to understand this and do we know well our supply chains? Because otherwise, when something really happens, we will be going around in circles, understanding what should we do? Because most companies, what has happened to them is during the pandemic is going around like this because we were not risk aware we were assuming that the risk will never happen to us. Yes, supply chains are fraught with risks, but some of the companies, especially in Sri Lanka, we were not really ready to face this uh, uh, new reality that is emerging in, in the global supply chains. So companies like Amazon, they had been very progressive in the past so many years. And now, although they are an e-commerce company, they are now into logistics. So they are looking at end-to-end -end logistics in their e-commerce business, right? So they themselves now have tied up with the Chinese company and they have their own containers produced now, 53 food containers, normally 20, 40 food containers. Now they have their own uh, you know, uh, containers being used in their supply chain. They have chartered ships to manage their supply chain to overcome this uh, uh, crisis that we are currently in in the, in the freight industry. Uh, and they have been in the past since 2017, they're also looking at uh, you know, uh, Amazon long range cargo jets and also trying to, you know, Amazon Prime Air is now actually uh, coming into, uh, into their entire network and they have their air hubs and all that. And uh, companies like IKEA, Walmart, and best, uh, the, the, the companies uh, are also now follow, follow them and then trying to charter ships and manage it to avoid the 
congestion that you see in the ports in the US. So they claim that, uh, Amazon claims that by doing this, they have been able to increase their port entry uh, across by 50% and that double their container processing capacity. So you have to really look at uh, the emerging trends that are happening in the global supply chains and quickly pivot into arresting the situation in the global supply chain dynamics. And similarly, as I mentioned earlier, also just a reiteration here again, companies are now seriously looking at, especially in the 66% of the North American companies, 17% of the European companies and outside China, 50% of the Asia Pacific countries are now thinking of moving out of China, having an, a backup location. Some are totally moving away from China and countries like Japan and Australia are incentivizing their companies who are based in China to move out of them because of the issues. And that has had a huge trade tension between Australia and China because of that. And these emerging uh, uh, trade wars, the emerging dynamics in the world, we should be uh, uh, understanding that, especially a country like Sri Lanka, we can tap into, the, tap into these global supply chains uh, that are emerging, uh, and you know, we can be part of that as well. And some of our companies in Sri Lanka also has really benefited from that. I know one of the companies uh, aluminium companies like you know when China moved out some of the companies were shifting things to Sri Lanka and there are many such examples the apparel industry uh, and um, personal protective equipment and all that there are lots of uh, companies who are proactively looking at these opportunities because of our uh, geographical uh, uh, location and and we are in the middle of the busiest east west route Sri Lanka is in an ideal position to uh, be a, a regional uh, logistics hub for these situations because already uh, Foxconn, the uh, Apple's contract manufacturer in China, they have operations in, in South India, in Chennai, Hyderabad, and also in, uh, in Bangalore. They've already committed to invest $1 billion, uh, uh, you know, to expand their capacity in, in uh, India to move some of the uh, low, low cost, uh, low, uh, lower level range Apple uh, products to India. So already these things are emerging. Already uh, some, some of the iPhone manufacturing is happening in, 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 uh, in Chennai and that is moving out. So how we can, I mean, these are emerging uh, uh, locations. I mean, we are just next to India. What can we do? How can we make use of these emerging opportunities? And another important area, so I'm coming to the end of my presentation quickly. So it's important to understand during the COVID, what we were talking about the digitalization, you know, so, so many years, which was being adopted by companies, it actually, accelerate digitalization into supply chains. Because if you need visibility, transparency, and you know, technology adaptation is the only way forward. So companies have really emerged into this space now. And some of our local companies in Sri Lanka are also slowly moving into that. So we have seen digitalization in procurement, robotization of manufacturing and logistics technology adoption in tacking and tracing, and you know, whole uh, era of data analytic led supply chain management is emerging now. Even in Sri Lanka, our 152 year old tea auction got into the uh, e-auction space during the pandemic last year, even the coconut auction. So a lot of good things happened during the pandemic because of these emerging uh, uh, shifts that are happening and COVID accelerating that. And not only that, we saw a huge emergence of the e-commerce market. Of course, Sri Lanka's e-commerce market is less than 1%, very small. But, but we saw some emerging trends that are happening. And globally, they say one CEO of an e-commerce company was saying, COVID accelerated the e-commerce, five years of e-commerce in five months. You know, we saw how companies are creatively managing the e-commerce, how they were doing delivering the last mile deliveries, 
how the fulfillment uh, uh, different uh, fulfillment uh, uh, options were being looked at creatively so i mean if you really manage the art of last mile delivery it is it will be a great um, uh, differentiator for the uh, e-commerce industry unfortunately in our country most um, companies feel that having a just a website will help you to get into the e-commerce it's much more than that that's just a the small drop only but unless you get your fulfillment and the last mile delivery uh, right you will not be able to manage your uh, uh, e-commerce very well so you saw different uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles delivering last mile delivery this happened during the pandemic in china jdl was delivering their last mile uh, delivery through these autonomous uh, vehicles and and you see these things are emerging in the global arena and we in sri lanka also adopted globe uh, blockchain you know especially the first uh, sri lankan terminal sagt was the first to join the the ibm musk uh, blockchain platform trade lens and they now this will help them to track and trace and the, the visibility on their uh, the shipments and all that and uh, very recently uh, electronic bill of lading the uh, isfar and brothers also got into the Uh, electronic bill of lading in the same trade lens platform and we also now see our farmers exporting to you uh, eu also got uh, gets uh, blockchain tech to certify their origins so it will improve significantly the traceability of the of the of the products and we also saw the collaboration kicking in i mean collaboration is the only way that we can manage our supply chains where you don't have a competitive advantage in areas we can collaborate and we saw companies like daras locally um, uh, partnering with sri lanka post pick me partnering with our healthcare the uh, facilities and you know government postal service partnering with the hospitals you know supermarket chains uh, partnering with logistics companies and even the arch rivals fedex and ups working together uh, you know in vaccine delivery and very recent one is the mars can uh, unilever partnering to you know manage the entire freight uh, portfolio uh, in the next 3 uh, to 4 years so it's going to be a whole different ball game in the ecosystem is going to change with this collaboration uh, because sometimes we in sri lanka mostly wouldn't like to collaborate with our uh, partners or competitors for that matter so i think you need to understand even in i mean in the us uh, you know walmart is uh home depot walmart is to transporting home depot uh, goods you know and amazon uh, actually and e is actually um, doing transportation of amazon marketplace customers they are competing with each other but of course there are anti competitive uh, laws there but you need to understand the opportunities available how you can manage your empty capacities in your trucks in your warehouse can you do on demand warehousing how do you collaborate with your partners because maybe your supermarket chains you are directly bringing stuff to the supermarket the same truck but how do we really manage together are things that we can really open to look at finally we have a huge climate emergency supply chains are really because mostly supply chains are linear way of managing you know you extract as much as possible you man make things and then throw things in a very linear uh, way but what is important now is we are in a climate emergency it is important for us to understand in the next uh, till 30 we need to make sure we need to maintain the temperature rise within 1.5 degrees and we need to really look at how do we really minimize the impact from supply chain so how do we decarbonize the supply chain how do we really look at waste minimization how do we really look at so we see a emergence in the carbonization uh, in the shipping industry aviation industry the entire transportation industry uh, in our supply chains and consumers are becoming very very conscious of the 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 the, the sustainable aspect of it in supermarket chains in some countries you see labels which talks about how many food miles it has traveled so there will be a, uh, you know pressure coming from consumers in different geographies in your own countries because of the kind climate impact because it's real business cannot survive there if there is no and uh, the the environment uh, for us conducive to operate 
So it is important to understand. And finally, the more and more regulations are being looked at because supply chains are becoming humanized now because companies increasingly around the world, the countries increasingly around the world are now focusing on how humanely you're managing your supply chain. Are you paying decent wages? Are you using child labor? Are you using slave labor? Are you having the right environmental conditions? Are you paying the decent wages? All those things are under close scrutiny now. And also the climate change. In the European Union has already brought in legislation to look at five items, coffee uh, and um, uh, I can't remember the rest of the things, but there are five items they are looking at to really give a certification that those items are not coming from deforested uh, sources. So you have to give a guarantee from your local authorities and they will trace it back. And you cannot enter EU if you uh, grow these agricultural producers coming into EU from uh, deforested uh, sources. So like that, all these aspects, the regulations are going to be, so global supply chains are going to be regulated more and more. And we as countries, especially in the developing world, we have to be mindful of that. And from January, 2023, the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act will come into force. So this will actually require companies to identify and assess risks on human rights and environment and all of that I spoke about. So more and more supply chains are coming into close scrutiny. So we have to understand the risk of these aspect as well. So finally, what I would like to uh, tell you is global supply chain shifts are continuously, continuously happening. So we need to understand first who the customers are, what are their needs. In-depth understanding of the consumers are very important because nowadays consumers are looking for personalization. Consumers want an intimate understanding. They want things faster. They want things to be delivered to any place, anywhere, any time of the day, in any, any quantity that they want, the fastest time possible. So we as supply chain professionals, globally companies must understand this new reality. And if you can tackle that, you will be a winner. And to do that, we need to have an understanding about your supply chain. Supply chain network visibility is key to that. Once you map your entire supply chain network, you can easily understand the vulnerable points in the supply chain. Once you understand the vulnerable points, you need to understand what can be done to minimize that. So the risk identification and developing a robust business continuity plan is a must. If you don't have it, you will fail in your supply chain. And you will not compete uh, you know, uh, well in the marketplace. And we also see now emergence of new supply chain business models. Companies who are in the e-commerce space is moving into now brick and mortar space. And companies in the e-commerce space are now uh, you know, getting into the logistics space. Consolidation is happening in the shipping alliances are getting formed. So you see many different supply chain business models and maybe companies who are in the adjacent categories are now moving into your space. So unless you are open to those new opportunities that are emerging and repurposing your supply chain, restructuring your supply chain, you will lose out. So in doing so, you need to manage digitalization as a key differentiator. You have a lot of opportunity in artificial intelligence, IOTs, machine learning, big data. I mean, the list is endless. You have so much potential and opportunity and you need to understand your digitalization strategy for the organization. How do you digitalize your supply chains, you know, to get into the next phase of your development and to really become a winner? And e-commerce is here to stay. I mean, maybe in Sri Lanka, we are very small and use, I mean, we saw uh, in the news that our Kapruka uh, pioneering uh, e-commerce company is going for IPO now, exciting plans that they're talking about. So you see, companies are now coming out of their uh, you know, comfort zones and moving into expansion and their strategies are very encouraging. And globally, you see how companies are moving and how do we manage your last mile uh, deliveries and fulfillment strategies are things because consumers want different options. Consumers want different 
payment options. Consumers want it to be delivered to any place. So e-commerce industry, if you're venturing, you need to make sure that you are ready to face those different uh, uh, consumer uh, requirements. And we also now have to ensure our global supply chain shocks have to be minimized. So there we see now China plus one strategy emerging and sure shoring they call it. You have to have an alternative option. Don't put all your eggs into one basket. And we see consolidation happening. Shipping alliances are formed. Companies are getting together. You know, Unilever, uh, must getting together, consolidating. So on the one hand, we are talking about uh, decentralization, but in certain areas you see consolidation is happening. So you need to really see how do you manage what is best for the organization. And localization with climate impact and our localization, how do you minimize Sri Lanka because of our forex crisis that we have, we are looking at localization, import substitution and all that. So countries are looking at these new emerging trends and collaboration is key. And in doing all of this, we need to be mindful of geopolitics, especially in Sri Lanka, with our geographical location and all that. Everybody is eyeing for our, our uh, countries, various um, uh, uh, for their own uh, operations and manufacturing locations and all of that. So we need to understand and make it to convert it to our own advantage. How do we really make use of those opportunities? So that we become a global logistics hub. How do we, how can we tap into that global supply chains that are emerging and become a logistics hub? And no business uh, cannot thrive on a dead planet. So we need to make sure that climate emergency must be addressed and supply chain is impacting the environment significantly. So we need to understand what are the areas and understand our carbon footprint, how we can really uh, become a sustainable supply chain. So decarbonization that is happening, emerging, we have to understand and MERS uh, in 2023 is going to have their first decarbonized ship, right? And supply chains are becoming humanized now with the complexities that are there. So you need to understand how you treat your workforce. How do you manage? Are you ethical? Are you sustainable? And are you aware of the regulations that are there in other markets if you're venturing into the export market? Those are important things to factor. And you cannot ignore, although you see automation, machines take over humans, but still you need humans to manage supply chains. So while all these digitalization efforts are ongoing, we need to also develop our human resource to understand with a global mindset understand how to, because you see the baby boomers are slowly uh, 1964 and before, they are retiring in the next 10 to 20, uh, 15 years. So how do we really get our millennials, the new generation, uh, ready to manage this new reality? Yes, they are uh, you know, digital savvy, but do they have an understanding on the end-to-end -end supply chain and this global orientation? So we need to develop these capacity building and understand these talent gaps. And finally, this Professor Howley's article on AAA supply chain is many years ago that he wrote is still valid now. We all in supply chain will have to be agile. We have to have agility is going to be the order of the day. And we have to quickly adapt and align because we have so many partners in the supply chains. How do we get the alignment? How do you get the relationship built to manage? Because in this era, it's not the biggest company or a biggest organization who will uh, be successful. It is the organization who will be able to quickly respond to the situation are the ones that we divide. So therefore it is the survival of the quickest who will win the day. So with that, I would like to thank once again for the organizers for inviting me. And uh, if there are any questions, I would like to uh, respond to it now. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was uh, Ms. Gayani D. Alvis, uh, today's keynote speaker today. Uh, on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, please accept our sincere appreciation, ma'am, uh, for your interesting presentation that you made to the audience uh, here today. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to hear about your thoughts about uh, 
uh, thoughts about uh, how supply chain is becoming new uh, new trends and uh, developing new uh, doors to the uh, new normal conditions. And uh, your stories about Chinese influences is also a uh, very uh, pragmatic and uh, very uh, uh, informative. And uh, about your slides, you showed, gave us a close look at the land and uh, the culture and how uh, the transformation have been uh, done during these new normal conditions. And uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your time and experience with us. And uh, we all agreed that your presentation is more uh, uh, valuable for the, the, the audience here in, uh, today in the conference. And thank you very much again. And uh, we appreciate your contribution as well. Thank you very much. And now uh, the forum is open for the discussion. As we know that uh, our time is limited. So your questions uh, will be uh, taken. And uh, if the audience, you can raise your hand when you have questions or any suggestions uh, regarding this presentation. So when uh, the raise hand is given, so I will give you a chance. Or otherwise you can uh, post your questions through the uh, question and answer segment. Now the forum is open for question. Okay, uh, I got uh, Mr. Namal Vandaranaika. He has uh, his hand. So uh, please uh, post your questions, Namal. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Alice, uh, for that very informative, very detailed presentation. So my question is, uh, so the, the we are seeing a lot of inflation in Sri Lanka. So I was wondering uh, how much of that inflation we see in Sri Lanka is uh, would be attributable to the these global shortages that we talk about and the increase in shipping rates. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, good question. There is a mixed signal in that. So if you really look at, we have a different problem set of problems in our country uh, when compared with other countries. Uh, if you really look at our Sri Lankan export basket and all that, we have a huge imbalance uh, between uh, uh, import and export in our country. So, and with also the debt burden that we have in our country, uh, our monetary policy and the actions that we have taken uh, also has a bearing on the, uh, the inflation in our country. So if you look at other countries around the world, also, yes, COVID has really to a great extent, uh, plus the shipping rates, skyrocketing shipping rates also have really impacted. But uh, Sri Lanka per se, we have other challenges in life other than the COVID. So you cannot totally attribute issues to uh, COVID, but we have um, other decisions that we have taken also has a bearing on those issues. Yes, I hope. I have answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Gayani, for your uh, suggestions and the, the answering of the questions. So any other questions from the audience? You have, uh, please raise your hand or you can uh, post your questions. While we are waiting for the questions, I just wanted to uh, clarify, ma'am, uh, one uh, few points about your presentation and uh, that was very uh, interesting and I was uh, and very informative. So a lot of uh, uh, take home lessons for us to be able to uh, adjust for the conditions now uh, now being adapted. So the, the my uh, concern about the, the how, because uh, now we are, uh, we are having a situation like uh, China has given a lot of influences especially for the countries like us, and uh, especially the political influences uh, with the geopolitic uh, uh, confrontations. And uh, do you think that uh, apart from this supply chain and these other, other uh, the technical aspects, do you feel that uh, the influences of about political aspects from the China has outperformed all the other 
uh, aspects during this uh, new normal conditions. So, uh, for example, if uh, if the, any any decisions you are going to make upon this supply chain concerns are also influenced by the political uh, the, the political geopolitics of China based on uh, these countries. So, can you uh, just uh, elaborate your opinion about these Chinese influences? Yeah, no, actually, um, see, unlike other countries, China, when they ventured out into this Belt and Road Initiative, they really wanted to connect um, China with the rest of the world, and they wanted to do it in, uh, uh, in a way that they will in, uh, increase the cooperation between countries rather than going in a confrontation mode. So having said that, you also see certain com countries who have really, uh, uh, you know, had uh, uh, more Chinese influence in countries, uh, had, uh, had implications in there, some other countries where China invested in port infrastructure and, you know, other various infrastructures in countries. When they are unable to repay the loans, then you will have other challenges where you will then end up acquiring that uh, infrastructure facilities and all that. So that uh, with some of these mismanagement of those um, uh, things has really led the world to believe that China is in a is always influencing their power over some weaker uh, developing countries, uh, which has a uh, bearing on their. Uh, I mean, affiliation yes. to China. So, but but I, I think uh, it's important for us to understand uh, if you, I mean, Sri Lanka, I mean, I, I will take Sri Lanka for that example, because our geographical uh, location is an ideal situation for us. We don't need to align to any country for that matter, because everybody is eyeing to be part of, um, come to Sri Lanka because of the uh, geo, what you call strategic location because 600 odd ships pass through uh, 10 nautical miles away from our, our ports. So therefore, obviously, uh, if you have a stake in Sri Lanka in some way or the other foothold, then it is going to benefit them because it's ideally located. So what is important for us is rather than align, that is my personal view, uh, rather than aligning to one country or China for, or India for that matter, we should be able to creatively look at these relationships with different countries uh, so that we would be able to better utilize these foreign relations in these countries to our advantage. Because these are big countries and we are a very small country. Uh, being small sometimes also helps to support, get the support from many others. So we creatively use these relationships uh, and manage it in a very um, uh, strategic manner we will be in a better position. Sometimes political decisions when they are made uh, overpowers the strategic uh, future of the country, then you will also fall into these traps sometimes, yes. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your concerns. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, when we are developing, for example, if we are trying to develop our own policies regarding this kind of new trade uh, opportunities, in the world, so the influences of this, uh, especially this, because of this debt concerns about China and the rest of the world as well. But um, if you have developed our firm policies that will be accepted by all the parties of the country, then uh, we will uh, directly say that these are the policies of the country, and we will be adapt. We will we are going to adapt these policies. Within these policies, we are going to uh, we are going to operate these trade affairs. That's what uh, I was thinking about. Uh, implemented at first, and then we will think about the rest of the trade uh, supply chains and rough supply reactions and all. Thank you very much. And uh, you have mentioned about the transformation about uh, towards the India, China towards the India, India uh, uh, with respect to some of the the, the, the high tech products. So that is good trend. Then the monopoly will be uh, deviated, and then uh, we will be in a position to uh, deal with some other countries. Then, and we can rely on some other countries also. So that will be a very good uh, move. And uh, with that note, I'm uh, again open the forum to the discussion. If you have anything to ask from uh, Ms. Gayani Alvis, today's keynote speaker, please uh, raise your concerns.
Okay, uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, because we are we are running out of time. Because uh, the next uh, keynote presentation will be in uh, line. So thank you very much for your concern and your uh, contribution towards this keynote speech and uh, very informative. And we will be uh, uh, be very glad for you to uh, for you uh, and your uh, participation today. Thank you very much for uh, giving this uh, keynote today. Thank you very much. Did you want me to